Hello everyone. I hope you can see me and hear me okay. Welcome to this seminar. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be able to do the introduction and then hand, hand over to your facilitator today, Catherine Hall, and to the amazing graduates that we have lined up to discuss their work. Um, I am in the far west of Ireland with a very dodgy internet connection. So if I disappear, uh, my good colleague Catherine has my script and can take over. I hope that doesn't happen. Um, welcome, anyway, welcome to you all. I'm gonna read you a little introduction that I wrote and then I will hand over to Catherine. Uh, so my introduction I called People and Planet Circular Design in Action. On March the 23rd, 2020, Boris Johnson told the country that people must stay at home and certain businesses must close. University of the Arts London duly closed its doors to students. We all went home and we stayed home. This date marked the beginning of an extraordinary period of time where students worked on the final year of their design degrees, found themselves working in isolation for many, many weeks. This was by no means an easy thing to do. Art school is all about the culture, walking through the studio splattered in paint, drinking tea with friends and talking endlessly, spending hours looking in the library or talking to a tutor you bump into in the corridor, impromptu walks along the Thames to clear your mind and your creative blocks with a trusted classmate, a drink in the pub after the long week of workshops, all these things that sound so simple silly even maybe, they help us build the framework of innovation and the creative process. The external factors of people in place help us scaffold our inner journeys. For some, completing a degree during lockdown was easier than for others. For everyone, it was an extreme challenge. And this, I believe, will stand the graduates in good stead, as our world is changing and we need to be ready to meet the extreme challenges that global warming is going to produce. As a designer and a design researcher, I've been thinking about these challenges for some years. They've become an inherent part of my practice. They form the basis of all my work and domestic decisions. Creating solutions and for making the design process the holistic and all encompassing compassionate activity that it must become known for. As designers, we're not here to make more stuff for existing capitalist systems. We're here to make new systems that make the old ones redundant, enabling people and planet to flourish for generations to come. In this introduction, I want to present to you the way I see circular design through the lenses of materials, models and mindsets. Circular design can offer us ways to envisage and realize new systems to meet the needs of people without compromising the health of the planet. For materials, designing with waste streams. Find a waste stream and use it to produce new value. Bring the power of creative thinking to see the problem as an opportunity for a new beginning. Whether it's food waste, agricultural waste or construction industry waste, Take what you find and make good. Consider how your decision-making changes as a designer when you're working with a waste stream. Note these changes. Help other people use waste in their locality too. Designing with waste streams may well mean a new, whole new set of rules and processes that can be adopted and adapted to suit local contexts. Designing for waste streams means understanding that whatever you're making now will produce waste and will eventually become waste. So you need to decide what kind of waste this will be. Will it be biological or technical? Will it compost and add to the Earth's natural regenerative cycles? Or will it be part of a recycling system that is mechanical or chemically reprocessing the material parts back into new materials? As a designer, you're essentially specifying for the future. You need to understand and support these future waste streams so that they can become healthy, contributing factors to change. For models, we need to develop design-driven innovation approaches. 
We need to challenge the way things are currently done and be part of the change process from an early stage in whatever field this is situated in. In other words, design can help. It's not a process that happens at the end. It can help at the beginning of addressing problems in every field. Some might call this design thinking. It can take the form of facilitating others to recognize and define problems, as well as supporting them to, to find suitable solutions. It can also, and I think most importantly, raise questions and highlight problems that would otherwise go unnoticed. Design new models create real change. For mindsets, designed to enable collaboration, communication, systems and behaviour change. As a designer, you have the power to reach people in ways that are unique to your practice. You are not only making things, you're making things happen. In designing for change, you need to build new and complex collaborations and support and maintain them in an ongoing fashion as you bring people along with you on the journey. Communication is absolutely key. It has the potential to change the way people and people act and interact and the way that they see the world and the problems and the solutions that lie ahead. As a designer, you may well be the glue that makes things work. It's not only about having ideas. It's about getting the ideas adopted and providing the broader context for change. Everything is connected. Design can be the everything. This is not an easy journey to undertake. There are easier ways to work as a designer. This route will not be for all, but if you take the design for change path, you'll be part of creating a future fit for people and planet. You'll need help. Find your tribe. Have empathy. See yourself as, as both a designer and consumer. Sign up for lifelong learning. None of us have the answers yet. So for now, let us enjoy seeing the problems and solutions these fantastic UAL graduates have explored. Let's see how they want to change the future. Okay, so with, without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to hand over now to a current student who is going to be facilitating this session with our graduates. So Catherine Hall is a PhD researcher uh, based at Centre for Circular Design, where, um, yes, I should have given you an introduction to me. If you don't know me, I'm a co-director of Centre for Circular Design at University of the Arts London. Um, and Catherine is a PhD researcher who will be moderating. So over to you, Catherine. Hello and welcome everybody. I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much, Becky, for the introduction. Um, as she said, I'm a PhD student from the Centre for Circular Design, um, but today it's not about me. It is about the graduating students. As Becky pointed out, I'm a current student and I'll be moderating this session. Um, I really enjoyed what Becky said about making things happen. And hopefully we're going to see some extraordinary work that the students have been producing um, over the last year in very difficult circumstances. And we're going to start asking the questions how we can change business, of usual, uh, business as usual. So I would like to introduce the four students. Uh, Silvia Martinez Terrero is a graduate from the MA Material Futures at London College of Fashion. We have Sarah Howard, who is a BA graduate in ceramics design from Central St. Martins, Ellie Winter, MA theatre design at Wimbledon College of Arts, and finally Bridget Johnson, who's doing BA fine art at Chelsea College of Arts. Um, I would like to invite uh, Sylvia to start her presentation. Hi, thank you for having me. I am Sylvia Martinez Cerezo and I do fashion activism and my work is mainly focused on overconsumption. So what I do is to raise awareness on the environmental impact, but also on the mental health consequences of mindless shopping. On one side, of course, because by buying less or repairing our clothes or recycling them, we can reduce the environmental footprint. 
but also because I am very interested in the potential of fashion to shape human behavior. And I believe that if we make responsible use of fashion forces, this could set sustainable values in our future lifestyles. So for me, it is very important to create things that everybody can relate to and stress that fashion is something that we all reinvent every day because there are many people who may not think of themselves as fashion insiders, but they do buy beyond what they need and they do get rid of things before it's time. The problem is that we have normalized overconsumption so much that we don't see this as a problem. That is why my work is all about the everyday choice and our individual power as consumers. So in short, what I do is to research on consumer behavior and fashion psychology, and I translate ideas into thought-provoking images or scenarios that are able to start the conversation on fashion consumption. For example, these are frames from a VR game that it is designed to challenge our ability to decision making throughout the different stages of a fashion shopping experience. And the purpose, as in everything that I do, is to inspire more critical and more active attitudes later in real retail spaces. And that's about it. Thank you very much for your attention. I leave it to Sarah. Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah. I've just graduated from BA Ceramic Design. And <clears throat> today I'll be talking to you about my project, uh, Circular Ceramics. Um, so Circular Ceramics consists of a tableware collection made entirely of industrial waste and also a book which outlines my methods for fellow ceramicists to apply to their production. So the focus of circular ceramics is to reduce the consumption of finite raw materials, divert waste away from landfill and educate ceramicists in making their production more ecological. So ceramics is made entirely of finite raw materials, many of which are expected to run out in the next decade. Um, materials like copper, you can see in this graph, is expected to run out in the next 16 years based on current rates of consumption and our known resources. Materials like zinc and tin are expected to run out in the next six years. And materials like silver and gold, which are used in ceramic lusters, are, are expected to run out by 2030. So what my project is looking at is how, um, what alternative materials we can use to produce ceramics so that, we, that the industry can continue to manufacture ceramics in the next 10, 20 and 100 years time. Um, so I began um, this project by looking at external manufacturers and external industries that consume the same raw materials as ceramics do. Um, so in the United Kingdom, 214.3 million tonnes of industrial waste is produced, was produced in 2016, of which 52.3 million tonnes were sent to landfill, which is just under a quarter. So even before the process of <clears throat> sorry, ceramic production, um, waste is produced when extracting clay from the ground. Um, nine tonnes of waste is produced for every tonne of clay quarried. Um, so the industrial waste that I began to focus on was uh, glass, stone, and the construction industry. And from this, I identified the waste streams in their production that were being sent to landfill and focused on these materials and how to use these materials to replace the raw materials in ceramic production. So these are the steps of processing waste materials for ceramic production. Um, on the left, you can see the construction waste, the middle is the stone waste, and on the right is the glass waste. Um, in, in the middle row is um, what they look like when they're reclaimed and the bottom row is what they look like once I've processed them ready for ceramic production. And this is some pieces from my tableware collection made entirely from industrial waste. And this is my book, which um, I currently am sharing with um, ceramic producers on a small scale, Studio Potters um, globally to act as a proof of concept to mass manufacturers who made me more hesitant to make these changes um, to, in their work. Um, and it, to me, it's really important that all my information and research is open source and ab available to everyone to start building an industrial symbiosis, whereby the materials from external industries are used as the raw materials in the ceramics industry. Um, and we start changing our behavior in the way we produce. And that's it from me. And next, I'm going to pass on to Ellie. 
Hi everyone, um, I'm Ellie and uh, I'm a theatre designer uh, studying at Wimbledon and my course is currently still ongoing so this is a project is a work in progress but um, great to get some feedback. Um, so coronavirus of course has been an incredibly difficult time for theatre and has put a big question mark over the future of theatre and um, it's forced us to think about how we make theatre more resilient and to think about the future and of course the other big question that hangs over the future is the climate crisis. Um, so the project that I'm currently working on is trying to experiment with some of these questions and it leads on from my dissertation um, where I explored what theatre's role could be in responding to climate change and why theatre has, has kind of failed in that area. Um, and I really focused in on one key area of the discussion and looked at the need to develop ways of representing more than human on the world's stage so when I use the term more than human I'm referring to sort of elements of the ecosystem which are essential for its survival and health for example carbon sinks such as rivers forests seas and swamps and how we begin to reconceptualize them as actors in the world system um, so I'm using my final project as a way of experimenting with the research that I collected in writing my dissertation and particularly feeding off two case studies which um, were really useful and inspiring, which was the um, the Living Stage by Tanya Beer and uh, the Encounter by Simon McBurney. And the Living Stage was an entirely biodegradable stage. Um, and uh, Simon McBurney's Encounter used binaural sound to bring to life the ecologies of the Amazon. Um, so for my final uh, project, I'm developing a virtual reality piece, which is under the working title of More Than Human, around uh, the ecology of Stave Hill, which is this park here on the uh, right. Um, and so this is the Long Meadow at Stave Hill. Um, so it's an eco park and it's currently under threat from developers who are looking to build a six storey tower block over the uh, park. So I'm looking to develop ways of um, sort of bringing awareness to these ecologies um, using sound and abstracted representations of key species. Um, so this development will change the soil temperatures by building this six storey block. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you wouldn't necessarily realise the impact that that has on insect life. Um, so the uh, stage or, or walk in which you can see in this slide here is um, an enclosed space and I'm looking at the best options um, to make sure that it's fully compostable, but um, currently under the idea of using mycelium and uh, straw bales, which could then go back into the park soil, uh, which is in dire need of improvement uh, as the park was created on a very tight budget in the 80s. Um, but hopefully an excellent opportunity to raise awareness and funds um, about, about the park and its importance. Yeah, thanks very much. I'll pass on to Bridget. <laughs> um, I don't have slides, but I just have a little thing to uh, say, I guess. Um, so back in December, I interrupted one of our third year fine art private views in the triangle space at Chelsea. Um, so I came in with a megaphone and read something that I had written that took the form of a kind of timeline. Um, it began with this quote from a 1912 New Zealand newspaper clipping that I'll read now. Um, the furnaces of the world are now burning about 2 billion tonnes of coal a year. When this is burned, uniting with oxygen, it adds about 7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere yearly. This tends to make the air a more effective blanket for the earth and to raise its temperature. The effect may be considerable in a few centuries. Um, then I went on to describe and kind of depict the current situation of the climate and I entwined this with UAL's inaction regarding it. So in 2014, a fossil-free UAL campaign was launched by a small group of staff and students they held discussions, launched a petition and had a die-in, all in an effort to get UAL to divest from fossil fuels. This was met with no response from UAL. However, in 2015, although UAL never acknowledged the divestment campaign run by its own staff and students, it did announce that it would divest 
its endowments of 3.9 million from fossil fuels and signed the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. So um, I decided to write uh, my dissertation in the form of an open letter to the UAL executive proposing that it should fulfill the 2015 commitment to full divestment and that it should also switch banks from RBS, the self-proclaimed oil and gas bank, to Triodos, a pioneer in ethical banking. Um, in the paper, RBS and the financing of climate change, it was stated that if carbon dioxide molecules had corporate tags of responsibility, the atmosphere would be full of RBS logos mingling with BP, Exxon and Shell. So I think that art has such a valuable place within speculative discussion around possible futures. Um, and it has an incredible ability to create an aid change. However, it can also be completely undermined by its respective institutions, hypocrisy relating to its own concrete actions as a business. Um, the commitment UAL made back in 2015 was to a full divestment from fossil fuels and evidence of this full divestment has never been supplied despite countless requests from staff and students alike. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all I have to say. Fantastic. Thank you um, all for your views, Sylvia, Sarah, Ellie and Bridget. I would like you all to invite you all back onto the screen for our panel talk now. Um, for anyone in the audience listening, we also have a chat bar. It's a private chat bar, so you can't see the comments, but I would invite you to put any of your questions for any of our four panellists um, that are speaking in the chat bar, uh, and I'll hopefully get through any questions that we have as long as uh, along with the questions that I'll be asking the students here. So our chat today, we're thinking about how can we change businesses as, as usual? And we've heard about all of your amazing um, product, uh, projects, thinking about being disruptive, thinking about being activist, thinking about materials, and lots of the things that Becky was introducing in our intro in terms of mindsets, materials, and models. So to kick us off, I would like to ask you, Sylvia, um, particularly in relation to COVID-19, the, the pandemic, um, because obviously this year has been a particularly disruptive um, year on students, as it's kind of been highlighted. Um, has your practice changed since the, the pandemic obviously happened partway through your final year? Um, for example, you use a lot of VR. Were you always planning to use VR within your practice or is this something that has adapted as you've gone along? Well, not always, of course, but it has been a while since I became more conscious about what my practice leaves behind. And when I work, I always find myself wondering if a project is worth, worth the resources. So I think that I found in VR and in digital media in general, an opportunity to create with no limits or no second thoughts. And this is why I feel like nothing can stop me from communicating ideas, which is what I'm really looking for. So I don't think that COVID changed the medium of my practice because I was already experimenting with digital tools, but it did change the topics and the scenarios that I'm exploring, of course, because this will change the way we consume for good. Absolutely, fantastic. Um, yeah, I think it, you bring up a really relevant point about the fact that with something like digital technology, um, it gives us kind of the freedom to explore without having to worry about resources. Um, I'm now going to turn to you, Sarah, because your project is extremely focused on resources. So let's go down the other end of the spectrum. Um, you're focused on materials and making um, and, um, and kind of the ceramics. Um, you're already working with waste materials. Um, how this different way of working and thinking about using waste materials and changing things up, um, how did that make you think about working in a different kind of way? Um, so being taken away from the studio, uh, luckily I'd done all my material investigation prior to um, COVID. So I had all the results and it. I was able to focus on how I could um, share my findings 
and help others and influence others in doing the same. So when I, uh, my final project was completely focused on the book um, and putting it together for other studio potters to apply to their practice, which when I look back on it, it has much longer longevity than presenting a tableware collection, which was what I was originally planning to do for the degree show. Um, I've been able to reach a global audience and speak to many ceramic producers across the world and help them individually uh, change their practice. So I think in terms of like the ecological impact that I've been able to have, it's much greater now than it would have been as originally planned. I mean, amazing. That's really great that you, even though you're doing something so material, that actually the benefits are from the non-material almost part yeah. of your practice. Yeah. We actually have a question from the audience uh, for you about um, the fact that you are looking at open source and creating that document, that non-material doc document um, yeah. comparative to the ceramics. Um, they, uh, Laura would like to ask, um, have you found an open source platform to share these designs and processes with the industry or artisan? Um, to enable to use it? Like how are you sort of yeah. attempting to share? So there's a platform called Creative Commons, which I've used and they have different levels of attribution. So you can pick which one suits you best and it provides you some level of protection, um, but it means that you can still um, share it widely and people will still credit you for the original creation. And um, if they go on to develop, it, develop um, your ideas further, then um, they are responsible to um, inform me on that and work together with me. So it's some level, um, but yeah, being open source is, I think, massively important if you want to make a big change and there's no point keeping everything to yourself because, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I totally agree. And there's actually one that follows on from this as well um, about um, how to ensure that the industry is going to adopt this, um, which, uh, is a question that I was going to ask later on, but I'll bring it forward because Linus from the audience has yeah, brought sure. this up. Um, how can you try and encourage industry to adopt this? I mean, currently business as usual is not using waste materials. So how would we, you, how do you suggest that you're going to deal with that problem? Linus suggests that we are in a bit of a hurry to put it bluntly. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Um, so by working with Studio Potters now um, and showing the ecological, uh, the ecological and financial gains that can be made by working in, with waste materials. Um, I hope that the smaller communities and industrial symbiosis that are formed across the world can then act as a proof of concept to mass manufacturers. So my plan was to later this year, work with a mass manufacturer to start um, implementing these methods, um, which I'm doing abroad because I know that manufacturers here are more stuck in their traditional methods. So, I'm, so by working with some uh, company abroad, um, I think I'll be able to do that more easily and with more flexibility. But yeah, by I'm almost relying on studio potters across the country and the world to help make a, a proof of concept for the big picture. But yeah, there definitely is economic gains for businesses. And when they realise that, hopefully that will be when the change starts to happen. Fantastic. I mean, it can be really difficult to kind of make such a huge change, um, which is why we need kind of big ideas, which are um, which all of you have presented really, really well um, and really exciting. Um, the other person that was looking at materials uh, was you, Ellie, um, although obviously in a completely different area where you were looking at theatre design. Um, you're kind of combining materials, sort of thinking about biomaterials with non-material, that kind of experience, the walk that you're thinking about in terms of theatre. Um, in the future, do you think we're going to move towards a uh, kind of more experience-based rather than more material-based? Um, which way do you feel like within theatre? I mean, you can look at theatre maybe digitally. Do you think that it's really important that we focus on these kind of materials? I know that's sort of part of your work. Yeah, I think that um, coronavirus has been really interesting to sort of reveal how important the sort of placeness of theatre is. I mean, that is essentially why it works, um, because I think on all of these amazing Zoom performances that very creative people have been putting out, it, you do realise that it's just, it's not the same and that theatre does operate as a sort of ecosystem and a feedback and you know you have from actor to audience and audience to actor um, and those sort of feedback loops are really really important so I think I would never want to get rid of the placeness of, of theatre 
but I think that we do need to think about how those buildings operate and how we can make them more porous so that they can sort of pour out of the theatres and, and back in and you know some yeah involve the communities through that kind of um, porousness yeah yeah I get the sense from your your work this idea of sort of community and the social side um, is really really important um, quite often I feel like we forget about the sort of social side um, when we talk about circular design as Becky mentioned in her intro um, that involves every kind of spectrum and um, yeah the social side I feel is really important um, how 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 much of an importance does it play in your work? Yeah I mean for me I think climate justice is social justice and you know these ecosystems we're part of them we're a huge part of the ecosystem so I think when we're thinking about um, climate change it's impossible to remove humans from them and we need we're the ones that need to change and <laughs> improve so yeah I think it's really important to bring people along with you on these stories yeah absolutely thank you um then kind of moving on to Bridget's work because yours is really intertwined in the climate I mean in terms of activism you walked into a space uh, disrupted um you know, spoke in quotes and talked about sort of a timeline, but directly um, at an institutional level. Um, I'm interested how you see COVID um, sort of fit into your activist sort of plans. I mean, we've had so much disruption with COVID. Um, how do you think that relates to the climate crisis? Do you think it's going to push us forward or do you think it's going to hold us back? Um, I think it's kind of they're so linked on so many kind of levels like the pandemic like climate breakdown is a result of globalized industrial consumer society's pursuit of growth so the pandemic has brought a sharp but temporary fall in fossil fuel consumption that is quite i don't know like a unique like pocket of time it's created that we could redirect the economy towards a more like sustainable path. So the issues of divestment and things are still more urgent than ever, but I do worry that there can be something in like, this being a new emergency in which emergency action is taken for a different reason. Like some of the first actions that countries took was to bail out airlines and things like that, as a, they just, I don't know, it. It's not really, it's definitely not a time to stop being concerned or stop like pushing for something different. Um, like I do think that businesses, companies and institutions will just try to continue to get away with what they can. So have to like, I don't know, not let up forever. <laughs> No, absolutely. I think you've really highlighted some of the positives that have come out of COVID. We quite often see in the news that COVID has been such a devastating and terrible um, pandemic across the world. But actually, there are some positives that have come out of this in highlighting, um, you know, the reduction in fossil fuels and maybe being able to push that forward is a really interesting stance. So um, thank you so I, much. I, I don't think I don't think the like that's I wouldn't say that it's a positive I don't I don't want it to sound like I no no not at all but it's nice to be able to uh, um, appreciate some of the positives that have come out of such a disastrous situation which is really nice um your work obviously is this um overarching kind of activist about some of the bigger issues but I want to kind of bring um the conversation slightly back towards the individual um, with your work um Sylvia you are focusing on shaping human behavior and really focusing on that individual and what we can do potentially as a consumer or educating us as consumers. Um, why did you choose that kind of individual stance rather than doing something a bit more like Bridget where she's looked at kind of much bigger issues? Because, well, in my case, I think you can approach fashion sustainability from very different, very different angles. You can be into organic materials or maybe more into second hand or more into a, a timeless vision. And it's really up to you and all options are valid. So I think that as in any change of habit, you have to find your own way to make it happen and be realistic on the changes that you're going to be able to maintain in the future, because that is the point. So 
I think that I focus on individual choice because I believe conscious consumption to be a personal journey. And I don't know, I think that I cannot really tell people what to do because I don't know it myself. And I'm looking forward for the change to come from within and then evolve into collective compromise. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a really interesting stance at thinking about the change from within. I think we probably need both aspects, you know, people like Bridget, who's uh, targeting the bigger picture as well as this kind of individual. In your particular work, you do things that are sort of um, thought provoking, um, you know, imagery. I particularly liked your VR experience where you go into a shop and the T-shirt sort of like with food packaging demonstrates the impacts um, how did you kind of come up with that idea to try and um, provoke the individual to think about some of their, you know, potential consumerism um, and prices? What was the ideas behind that? Well, the idea is to engage people to activate the critical thinking. And I think that I am looking for a long term solution to fight overconsumption. And I think that I really want to inspire people to become critical consumers and be able to face by themselves fashion contradictions. And I think that through disruption, you train your mind to look at things differently. And that's what I'm trying to do. And I think it is more useful to do it this way. And somehow I feel like I invite people to take part on the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, taking a slightly different stance, I'm gonna move back to you, Ellie. Um, your work thinking about that park space um what i found really interesting when i was looking into your work is the idea that in this canary wolf area the um construction that's going to go on as part of the urban development um was going to cast a shadow over this park which potentially could cause some problems with biodiversity and insect life um so your theater design and project is about helping the environment and kind of allowing the environment to be a stakeholder. Um, how did you kind of come to learn about these issues and how did you learn to kind of incorporate it within your design work? Um, that's quite a challenge. Your, sorry, your sound's not on, Ellie. I'm on mute. <laughs> um, so it kind of comes back to coronavirus again because I moved location, I moved to uh, Surrey Keys at the beginning of lockdown and um, I went to the park a lot for my sort of daily exercise and um, I first came across the uh, Canada Water Master Plan through leaflets and then later when I interviewed the park warden who's been there for 30 years, um, really amazing woman called Rebecca Clark and um, she that they were the initiative has been formed sort of against the Canada Water Master Plan by residents, not just on the basis of the ecology, but also on the basis of the the way in which the social housing has been situated. So it's in one block, and the shade will also go across the park. So it's like on many levels they haven't really consulted the community. Um, and I guess I came from it from I came up sort of through the park angle on it, but um, I guess it's just. The, there's a very strong sense of community around that park. Just um, there's an amazing archive with sort of interviews with residents, and um, you get a sense that it's a real place of of love. Um, so I think, yeah, I guess that's sort of the angle that I came at it through. It's really nice. I mean, the idea of this um, sort of social aspect and community aspect. Um, part of your project, you were thinking about creating a sort of it's a, a sort of a temporary walk that's going around. Um, it's interesting that kind of temporary solution um, that could be part of a community, but then will disappear again. Um, quite often, when we talk, use the word temporary, it brings up ideas of waste, mess. And then all of the stuff that gets left behind, which usually people don't clear away um, particularly well. Um, how are you addressing that in your design? Um, and why is it important that it's temporary and not something more permanent? Um, I guess the nature of theatre is often very temporary. Um, we're kind of focused on this very ephemeral spectacle. And I think that theatre needs to reconfigure that. But I think it's probably um, unlikely that it's going to completely disappear. So if we can work solutions around that with those problems, I think we'll come up with more creative options than just sort of getting rid of temporary completely. Um, I think we can definitely reduce individual impact, but um, I think that, yeah, to get rid of 
of it is perhaps a bit naive um, and we can work more with it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, in terms of the materials, I know that your project in particular is a work in progress. You will be graduating this September as part of class of 2020. Um, how have you gone about um, thinking about the types of materials that you want to use and, and sort of sourcing those? I know, I'm aware that this is still a work in progress, but I'm interested to hear about that sort of journey in terms of design and thinking about the material point of view. Um, yeah, I mean, this very much is still a work in progress, if I'm completely honest, but um, I guess collecting materials from the the park itself, uh, it's very close, it's on the Rotherhide Peninsula, so it's very close to the Thames, so I've sort of been taking samples and kind of working out what options, what recipes might make sense for that, that space, but um, I also, uh, a friend who's an architect recently graduated and did a project with mycelium, so I've been sort of trying to get advice from her. But um, yeah, I haven't definitely got a solution yet. So I think I have to wait on that one. <laughs> That's really interesting. It's interesting that you um, have sort of collaborated with other people. So quite often, um, particularly as students, it's very easy to sort of sit in your studio and just think by yourself. Um, I was wondering, um, Bridget, uh, did you collaborate? As I know that you worked with other students that were part of this uh, group that you were talking about. Um, did you collaborate with um, the staff and the students as part of that group to kind of develop your ideas and think about the activist approach that you were taking to the climate, divestment um, and all of those issues? Um, yeah, I worked um, quite closely with um, alumni from the year above, Sam Stafford and also David Crofts, who is a reader at CCW. Um, and we all we did a podcast together that is like it's called um, a place like the present, um, and it's run by Chelsea alumni. But um, yeah, there was uh, the tutors were very supportive <laughs> about this stuff because I think I don't know when you were like thinking about ideas that are quite niche or upsetting to a lot of people and it's uncomfortable to talk about and a lot of people don't want to talk about it it's um good to have uh, people <laughs> on side <laughs> absolutely that collaborative element um is often so important especially um from my perspective as a circular designer, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without speaking and collaborating with other people to kind of fill those knowledge gaps. Um, Sylvia, can I also ask you about collaboration and about um, your experience of kind of non-material and VR and kind of questioning? Have you been able to collaborate with anybody to be able to a create the uh, works that you've done um but also to kind of get that message out there we've seen bridget who's literally walked into a space but how do you sort of address getting that message out there has that involved any collaboration well it did because i am not super techy myself but i had the opportunity to collaborate with a technician and he helped me to create the vr game so i was basically learning from them and working together it was just like I don't know. I don't think I did this myself. Actually, I had a lot of a lot of help and a lot of conversation about how to develop the game and how to communicate the ideas better. So it was a collaboration in itself, I think. Brilliant. And what about um, where you see this kind of work getting out there? How would you be able to push this message to be able to teach the individual? Um, kind of, you know, push that forward about anti-consumerism and some of the choices that they're making individually and the impacts? Well, I am not anti-consumerism. I believe that you have to take control of your own choices. And I think that is very rewarding. So I don't believe in not buying anything because that means that you're not in control what, of what you do. You have to be able to buy in a healthy way and feel good about it. So what I wish I could translate what I did into real retail spaces and, you know, like pop up reminders of maybe you don't need this and maybe think twice because I think we, the retail environment influences a lot. And if we just take a moment to think twice, we just maybe change our mind and make a better choice. So I don't know, I just, I want to be there in the real space I will find out how but 
yeah, I want to be there. That's a really interesting concept, that kind of idea of real space. I mean, at the moment, we're all sitting at home. <laughs> um, when yeah. we are able to get back out into that kind of real space um, as kind of a, a pop up and getting people to think about their purchases. Um, how do you think this might be able to translate into actual business? You know, could pe would uh, fashion companies, for example, be able to change their business models to kind of help with this consumerism as sort of Bridget's pointed out, we're kind of in this capitalist society where it involves buying more and more stuff, which um, obviously you're uh, promoting a more healthy uh, consumption. Um, how do you think that you, how your message can translate to business? Well, I think that there are many ways of keep on consuming by, but not making use of resources. I think it has to go more into experience more into rental, more into things that we already have and repurpose what we already did. And I don't know, maybe exchange clothes or I don't know, just look at what we already have and look at it differently. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's some really interesting ideas about this help more healthy consumption and thinking about yeah sharing and the sharing economy um there's loads of different models out there which is really exciting um in terms of this kind of consumption and thinking about our materials i'm going to return to you sarah um thinking about ceramics um i have a, a question from the audience um that says are there opportunities for industrial waste to be used slash reused in other sectors as well um you know obviously you've been very much focused on ceramics um you've looked outside of the area of ceramics to see um but in your research have you seen any other connections elsewhere yeah it's, uh from my research oh, you're on mute there Clara. hello hello yeah, we can hear you. Oh, Brilliant. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, from working with the construction industry, um, they they were probably one of the hardest industries to get into. I find that they're quite secretive because I believe it's because they know that they are responsible for a lot of waste, and the way they consume materials is quite flippant. Um, and they like a lot of the construction industry, smaller businesses um, tip waste illegally because it's too expensive um, in terms of the weight and the volume to dispose of uh, and pay for it. So definitely the construction industry, um, the, for the world's first industrial symbiosis, it was in, it's in Kolumborg in Denmark, and they work with um, 11 manufacturers and exchanging heat, energy, materials like gypsum, which is used in plaster, and they generate zero waste, which is incredible and uh, the financial savings that they make is incredible and it's yeah we just need these relationships and material knowledge um, in order to build these symbioses but definitely um, applicable and I hope to expand my current industrial symbiosis and link more industries and more waste streams um, so it can grow. Yeah, it's really interesting you talk about this idea of kind of relationships and, um, you know, one waste, uh, waste stream can feed into a, one industry and then another waste stream can feed into these kind of really complex open loops, um, hopefully where we have no waste in the future. Um, I wanted to ask you that whilst you were sort of discovering and thinking about using these waste materials, was there anything that surprised you? I know that you did do some actual experimentation and you have demonstrated that you did create some ceramics. Was there anything that you thought, oh, I'm going to try this? and um, it didn't work at all as you expected or something that you thought you or accidentally happened and you thought oh that's amazing yeah so I went when I began my experimentations I sort of had no expectations about what might happen but um, once I was getting these waste materials and I found that the waste so like the glass panels once it was um, the waste that I get from the glass is from polishing the edges it creates a slurry which is toxic and uh, to me, I was quite shocked at how it didn't really change the composition of the materials at all. Um, and I could use it in the same way I would use silica, which we use in ceramic production to make glazes. Um, so like that was quite a shock. And also the uh, financial savings that you can make, um, it almost, like I was confused why it hadn't been explored before because I wasn't paying for materials and um, I was just diverting waste away from landfill. So 
it wasn't easy, but I was surprised that um, I wasn't coming across material difficulties as I had problems with consistency across different batches from the manufacturer for batches of waste. But apart from that, it, it wasn't too surprising, but yeah, it went all, somewhat went to plan, yeah. That's brilliant. Um, it's really exciting um, to hear you kind of talk about your experience of making and being creative because um, that's what being a student is is all about and experimenting with ideas that perhaps the industry is a little bit scared to kind of do and go uh, against this business of business as usual yeah. scenario. Some places I just I would walk onto their manufacturing site and just be like, can I have some waste? And some most places were more than willing and um, it saves them money. So um, I was surprised. Yeah, people were really friendly and are willing to hand over their waste apart from the construction industry maybe but yeah most places like more than happy to take part so that was really surprising as well fantastic yeah i think that um quite often we all get surprised at how willing and excited people are to kind of get them get involved in some of these conversations people are quite passionate and quite often don't really know um what to do in those situations they can make a help whether it's the individual like in sylvia's work is trying to promote or whether it's uh, towards kind of bigger issues societal issues like ellie's work um or bridget's work where it's a bit more um bigger issues with climate change. Um, I have another question from the audience. Julie has asked, uh, this is a question for everybody. Um, in your work, is there a place for galleries, museums, and traditional spaces for showing art? And I'd quite like Bridget to have a stab at working on this because your work is kind of more vocal and has been maybe an open letter. Um, where do you see the position for galleries, museums, uh, for showing art um, that are producing a message like yours? I think, yeah, sure. Like, <laughs> um, I just take issue with institutions and spaces that don't align their own action with the work that they show. And yeah, like, I think they can be useful and are really good spaces for sharing ideas and like to have community but there really has to be more fluidity within them where the topics that the work is like discussing or trying to talk about or change is mirrored by the actions on a business level because all of these places are businesses above everything else and if that isn't like if that doesn't comply with the work or the ideas or the thing that they are putting out and being liberal about then the hypocrisy is massive and it can't like it just contradicts the whole thing but yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i think that's a really interesting and valid point and we see that um whether it's uh, climate issues, whether it's uh, social justice issues, um, particularly where we look at um, colonialism and those kinds of things and making sure that some of these uh, spaces, galleries, museums and traditional spaces for showing art are complying with some of the, the work that are going into them. And I think you raise a really interesting point. Um, I know that you, Sylvia, um, were talking about a kind of pop-up space. So I guess, would you, equally be happy sh sharing your art um, your work within a gallery context as well as more kind of on the ground um sharing with consumers i think it will have a place it could work in a gallery but as i said i think for me using the real retail space would be much more shocking or it would be more powerful to show my work there because i use a lot of content and I'm also very interested in the moment that when you're in the shopping experience. I think our mindset is very different when we are in a gallery and we were shopping. So I'm more interested in the in the real moment. It's actually a really interesting point in terms of the different contexts and how it kind of makes you react. Um, and I, I guess with Bridget's work on an institutional level, walking into an institutional type gallery space um, or writing a letter um, kind of makes more sense with her work. Whereas, as you say, it might have more of an impact depending on those things. Um, we're almost out of time. So um, I would like to uh, thank the audience for their questions. And as a roundup, I would like to ask each of you to complete the sentence. I want to change the future by. And we'll start with Ellie. 
Ellie, your microphone's on mute still. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, I want to change the future by making theatre that helps unravel stories around climate change. Brilliant. And Sarah? Sarah, sorry. Um, I forgot what the sentence was, but I know it's along the lines of, I just, <laughs> what was I want to change the future by? I want to change the future by connecting and um, getting industries to collaborate with each other. Like Becky said in her introduction, being the glue um, to, as a designer, just connecting everybody. That's... Uh, and Bridget, please. Um... Um, at a UAL institutional level, I would say that everyone within it is given equal power in a kind of devolved cooperative kind of way, and then everyone can decide all together how the university acts in both business and academic realms, and then, like, bigger than that, um, abolish the police. Amazing. And finally, Sylvia. I want to change the future by inspiring people to see in everyday choice a meaningful solution. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your creativity uh, and your passion about people and the planet. Uh, for all of those uh, watching, there will be a link in the chat to the graduate showcase so you can see some of this student's work as well as all the other amazing student work that has been going on at UAL as part of the graduate showcase. Um, I will also make sure that in the chat there are links to each of these students' um, social media, I think their Instagram tags. Um, so if you have any further questions for them or you want to get in touch, uh, you can do. Uh, but thank you all for joining and thank you very much again for our speakers. Um, we hope you have a really good rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.